All right, welcome everybody. <clears throat> We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to Zoom on this beautiful October morning. Thanks for coming. Uh, I think most of you folks know me. My name is Jonathan Weber. I'm the Complete Streets Program Manager at Local Motion. Um, I'm joined by Susan Grasso, who's our Complete Streets Program Associate. And um, Susan and I work together as a team to support uh, folks who are working to make their communities better for walking and biking. And that you know includes local advocates, it includes town staff. Um, we also do a lot of advocacy at the local and state level. So we're really here to support folks like you. And uh, one of the ways that we do that is through uh, education and webinars like this one. And today we're gonna be talking about uh, some survey results that we gathered uh, last year here in Chittenden County. Um, Susan is gonna be monitoring the chat for any questions. Uh, so feel free to post them or any comments that you have. And then um, also feel free to raise your hand if you would rather um, use your voice to ask a question. So uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump in. So, um, as I said, this is analysis of some survey data collected last year, looking at active transportation trends in Chittenden County. Uh, the project team on this was, was myself and our intern, Carly. Uh, Carly did an awesome job taking all the data we had gathered and um, sort of making it all into this great presentation, which uh, I think is a really nice product. So shout out to Carly for all of her work on this. So the purpose um, behind this survey, oops, Purpose behind the survey was to capture key insights on public opinion and inform decisions regarding uh, walk bike policies, conditions, and improvements. Um, local Motion coordinated the survey. We had funding uh, from the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. Um, our staff drafted the survey questions with some help from our pollster, um, and we solicited input from um, a lot of stakeholders throughout the county. Um, we also, uh, the survey was administered by Involved Research, which is the nonpartisan unit of change research. A little more on the methodology. Um, it, in total, it was a sample of 588 Chittenden County residents. Um, and it, the, the survey itself was administered between August 31st and September 2nd. Um, the margin of error is around 4.2%. Um, and this was fielded on Facebook and Instagram. This is not a phone survey um, that allows uh, change research or Embold actually to adjust um, the demographics that they're serving the ads to for the survey as the results are coming in um, so that they can reduce the need for waiting after all of the results are, are in. Um, political orientation was not accounted for in the sampling, basically. Um, the funding that we had from the Regional Planning Commission to allow us to do this um, can't be used for what's considered political research. So uh, just be aware that, you know, political orientation and the differences in opinion on the questions in this survey and the differences in behavior that come with that, just they're not sort of baked into the data here. Um, Finally, the, uh, the data was weighted you know, after everything was said and done to depict the gender, age, uh, race, ethnicity, and education of adults uh, accurately in the county. So uh, this presentation um, and, and the survey in general was sort of uh, divvied up into three focus areas. Um, we're gonna start with the first. Uh, which is what are people's current transportation behaviors? So we're looking at how people get around, um, barriers to biking in particular, and then also uh, very specifically to winter biking. Um, so this presentation is gonna be these three sections. Uh, we will stop after each one um, and take some questions and have some discussion uh, because there, there's a lot of data and a lot of things to consider um, in each segment. So we'll jump right into current transportation behaviors. So I think um, most of us probably intuitively know this, that most people in Chittenden County, uh, sadly, are car dependent. Uh, they report driving as their primary mode of transportation. Um, and the remaining 14 or so percent um, get around, you know, 4% walk, um, and then between three and 1%, you know, carpool, 
uh, ride an e-bike or a bike, uh, take the bus or ride a motorcycle. We do see that uh, people of color, the lowest income group uh, and the lowest age group are generally twice as likely uh, to carpool, bus, bike, or walk um, than the rest of the population. Um, and that sort of data point and those demographics being more reliant and more interested on, in walking and biking is something that you're sort of going to see carried throughout this presentation. Um, looking at the same question in Burlington, so which transportation option do you use most often? Um, we do see you know, a much lower percentage of people driving. So if you compare Burlington to um, the rest of the towns in the county, 75% of people in Burlington drive as opposed to 90% of people in the, in the towns outside of Burlington. Um, and then the walk rate is much higher, 11% as opposed to 1% in other towns. Um, the bike rate is also almost double, um, although still just 5%. So this, of course, you know, it suggests a lot of different things. I think the primary thing is, you know, Burlington has um, the densest land use, um, the highest concentration of origins close to destinations, which, you know, just makes walking and biking uh, much more convenient, much more doable for more people. I think it's likely that there is a, a similar effect um, within the other, you know, denser town centers throughout Chinyan County. Um, but we are, we're only splitting the data out um, for Burlington. So when we look at uh, secondary modes of transportation, we asked people uh, which other transportation options have you used in the past month? And they were able to select um, all that they had used. So 50% uh, of people um, walked for transportation. 26% um, of people didn't really think they used any other mode of transportation. Of course, you know, probably all of those people are also walking or rolling um, some way to get from their car to where they're going. Um, a fifth of people uh, biked or e-biked as a secondary mode, which is awesome. Um, and then uh, you had dropped off and carpool and the ride sharing um, after that. Um, you may note that uh, Transit is not in the top five for secondary modes of transportation. However, 22% um, of people of color use um, the bus as a secondary form of transportation as opposed to just 4% of uh, white residents. So pretty big difference there. Um, we also see that uh, just an interesting data point, the, the lowest income group um, reported using the ride sharing apps actually the most frequently. Um, over twice the rate of the middle and highest income groups. I think there are a couple of different ways to explain that data point. You know, one possibility is that uh, that really represents students and sort of the younger population um, who are, you know, using it to go out on the weekends and, and get home safe. Um, another possible explanation is that lower income people who don't have a car, don't have access to uh, someone who can give them a ride in a car um, and are not served by the transit network or by the bike network um, are really reliant on ride sharing when they need to get to a destination that's not within you know, walking or biking or bus distance, um, which is of course a really expensive way to get around. So the next question we asked was, uh, what prevents you from biking more often? So trying to get these barriers that people experience that keep them from biking. And the number one that we saw was that their destinations are too far away. Um, it just doesn't feel realistic to bike from my house to work or to where I go shopping. Um, number two, I don't own a bike. Um, and then number three was the lack of safe bike infrastructure. Um, and then there are, you know, there's sort of a, a handful of reasons beyond that. But those were the top three. Um, and this is throughout the county. We did see that um, women and people of color express a higher level of concern for safe bike infrastructure compared to um, men and uh, white residents. So you can see that that difference in that bottom, bottom left hand corner there. And then again, sort of the comparison to Burlington, we see that um, destination being too far away really drops off quite a bit. It's, it's still one of the top three barriers. Um, but it's not the top barrier. Instead, the top barrier in Burlington is actually a lack of bike ownership. 
Um, and then lack of safe bike infrastructure is still the third here in Burlington. So I think, you know, it really emphasizes again, the that importance of land use and, um, you know, helping our places develop with, you know, higher levels of density and more mixed use so that people can um, walk, people can walk and bike to the places where they need to go. And those places are close, close enough for them to do that. Um, I think it also highlights the importance of organizations like Old Spokes Home that focus on um, getting bikes to people, um, as well as, you know, having a good regional bike show program. Finally, getting into uh, winter biking. This was actually, I think, one of the one of the most surprising and encouraging results in the survey. We asked people, how likely would you be to ride your bike for transportation in the winter if the streets had safe and well-maintained bike infrastructure? And we saw that people were about split on this. About half of people said they were very likely or somewhat likely uh, to bike in the winter. And about half of people said they were very unlikely or somewhat unlikely. And um, Personally, I, I would have expected the um, the likely uh, responses to be much much lower than they were in this. So I thought this was really encouraging and a great indication that um, if we can make the investments in our bike infrastructure and do the maintenance to make sure it's it's really um, nice to ride in the winter, that people will use it. People are not afraid of being cold. This is Vermont, and uh, they'll get out and bike as long as we make it reasonably nice to do so. So some key points um, from this first section, uh, and if you've got questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand or post them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them. Um, number one, as we said, Champaign County is mostly car dependent, but there's that comparatively lower rate of driving and higher rates of uh, walking and biking in Burlington. Um, marginalized communities, um, people of color, lower income people are more likely to rely on forms of transportation other than driving. Uh, and finally, changes to land use, uh, you know, promoting more of that mixed use development, destinations near uh, origins, initiatives that increase access to bikes and improving infrastructure and winter maintenance are really key to addressing barriers to biking. So do we have uh, questions, comments, thoughts people want to share at this point? Susan, let's go to the chat first. I saw a couple things. Yeah. <clears throat> so Will Will was asking, Will Dodge was asking um, about the timing of the survey um, and the, the fact that it was done um, in late summer. So uh, with the questions um, asking about behaviors uh, over the, the previous month, we can assume that this data really represents uh, some more summer riding. Uh, he didn't. He didn't ask specifically about what we might expect the survey to say uh, if it were conducted in the the winter time. But maybe you want to speculate on that a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So the data. Um, you can basically say that the data reflects um, set behavior from August twenty twenty two. That's that's when we feel that it was at the end of August. So we asked about the past month. Um, you know, in terms of what it would have reflected in terms of the winter, if we had fielded this and asked the same question in the winter, I'm sure rates of biking would have been much lower um, during the winter. You know, I think we we all see that anecdotally that there are fewer people riding. There are still a lot of people out that I see. Um, and also, I think that that's changing as our winters sadly are becoming more mild. Um, personally, I know that I'm riding more frequently and um, not having to, you know, wear a snowsuit <laughs> as, as frequently and pose my bike off as much. So um, I think that's changing, but I do think it would be, it would be lower if we had asked the same question in the winter. We have some hands up. Uh, yeah, no other questions in the chat and I don't see any hands up. I think Phil, I think I see that Phil has hit. I'm gonna Phil, I'm gonna unmute you. So go ahead. Phil, if you've got a question, go ahead. There we go. There you are. Because uh, of my magnification, it took a while to find. 
all the way over on the right part of the screen. Um, Jonathan, how much of this do you feel is a reflection of the lack of infrastructure money put into um, Burlington, Chittenden County, and the rest of the state? It seems that we put 90% into car-centric transportation and whatever is left over, I think it's 2%, uh, goes into transit, walking, and biking. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I think that has a huge effect on um, on the data and on how people people get around. Um, you know, we saw just for example, I'll flip back to this barriers question. We did see, you know, lack of safe bike infrastructure is um, is a barrier for you know is sort of the number the number three barrier. So it's definitely um, up there. And if we were investing more. Um, in that infrastructure, I think there would also be stronger political support to maintain it. There would be a stronger bike culture. It would be more accepted. Um, all kinds of things I think would, would sort of grow from that. So, um, and yeah, that the lack of funding is really, is a key barrier to building more of the, the good infrastructure that we need. So yeah, I think that's definitely a huge component here. So how can we make this more of, well, local motion and, and other groups working with active mobility? Uh, how can we better get this on the ballot so that we can increase the funding? It is, it is a, a priority for us. It's probably our top priority coming into this legislative session. One of the key um, sources of funding for bike and pedestrian infrastructure in Vermont is the state um, bike peg grant. Um, and I just actually got uh, the past five years of data on that. And over the past five years, it has only funded about 30% of the requests. Um, so that's a lot of infrastructure that towns wanted to build that they haven't been able to um, over the past five years. Um, I did see, I think, um, our partners at the regional planning commissions also really want to see that increase. Um, so yeah, it, it is a priority and, um, you know, for, for local motion, spending more time on, on lobbying is something that we, we are always trying to do. Um, and if folks want to see us doing that, I, I would encourage you to donate because we, we do need, um, that kind of unrestricted grassroots donation in order for us to, um, to spend that time. Well put. Thank you, Jim. Jonathan. We also have a question from Will. Let's see, Will, you should be able to, uh, to chime in now. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, first of all, thank you for this survey. I think it's really great. I think it's a it's a really good, you know, solid building block to to start on. And I guess what I would encourage is like looking at this chart in particular, right? You know, it's it sort of goes to well, what what comes next? And obviously, um, sometimes I think you know some of these answers can be a little um, deceptive because, for instance, um, I know that. So, like I, some people who live in Essex, like I do, and and commute into Burlington, think, well, it's too far away. But what I've found over time with an e-bike is that you know my sort of average car commute takes about twenty five minutes, and if I go in on an e-bike, I can get here in thirty five minutes. And I would not have known that until I actually like started to get better at just navigating and kind of using the bike. So the so when I think about that the convenience factor would change for me. And similarly with lack with the bike infrastructure, I think it would be great if you guys had a survey that maybe got out okay, well what of the investments of the public investments that could be made in bike infrastructure, what is the most, I don't know, requested, what's the most effective? Like is it Obviously, you know, uh, dedicated multi-use paths like we have on Route 15 now, that made a huge difference for me. 
Um, when I go to Montreal, I look with envy at those um, posts that can separate, you know, cars, the car car paths from bike paths or roads from the bike paths. So it'd be interesting to get more uh, data about sort of like what, you know, what would the commuter think if certain types of improvements were made? So anyway, that's more just a comment. I think it's a great, uh, really great work that uh, that was done on this survey. Yeah, th thanks, Will. That that is a great um, a great comment on the on the e bike um, point. We will get to that a little later. We have a section on e bikes that's going to be our third section. So we will get at that um, question of the effect on e bikes to these barriers and how they're different for a person on an e bike. Um, and um, yeah, on the infrastructure point, totally agree with you. You know, there's there's been a lot of great planning work done in the county. The Regional Planning Commission has um, an active transportation plan that was updated this year that does look at sort of what are the most effective, important um, segments to focus on. Um, and then um, I would really encourage folks to check out actually the last webinar we did on level of traffic stress, which really gets at um, looking at like what is the appropriate kind of bike infrastructure given the context you know the the volumes and the speeds on the street what does it take to really make a person feel comfortable um, there's actually a pretty objective way to determine that um, using level of traffic stress so Susan can probably put the link to that in the chat um, so thanks Will um, and we have um I will put that link in in, in just a minute um, we don't have any other hands up. Um, Stu, Lindsay makes the point though, um, related to this conversation about, um, destination being too far indicates that housing near services is a key barrier. Uh, so that's, that's a whole nother really important conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think that land use question is is really important, and I think a lot of municipalities, you know, have a lot of work to do on that, and and some are starting to do that work, and um, it's a great, it's hugely important for getting more people walking and biking. I also saw Jean Bergman asked about us sharing this with the Transportation Energy and Utilities Committee of Burlington. Um, I can't recall if I shared this with those folks specifically, but Jean, I absolutely will. And, um, and yeah, we are going to be sharing this more with elected folks in general. Okay, I'm going to keep us moving because we're uh, almost halfway through already. So the second section gets into uh, perspectives, uh, basically asking people how they feel about this stuff, what their priorities are, what kinds of policies they would support, um, and what kinds of investments they want to see. So uh, first off, we asked just generally, do you support or oppose your community increased investment in biking and walking infrastructure? Um, and really strong overall support for this at 67% um, throughout the county. And then on the right, again, you sort of see this pattern of people of color, you know, Burlington residents, women, younger people in the lowest household income group having um, levels of support above um, above the average throughout the county. So I think, you know, this is really encouraging that people want to see more of this stuff. They encourage, they um, support their community spending more, more money and more capacity on it. Um, this question is, is a little tricky. So this is basically trying to get at um, how, you know, how people would position trade-offs between the types of transportation initiatives and investments we can make. This is based on a question that the Regional Planning Commission asks um, in its five-year survey. Um, we made some changes to how the options were described, um, and we got a very significant difference in our results from what the, the Regional Planning Commission had. Um, basically, in the Regional Planning Commission's results, they tend to see safety ranked as number one, um, and then I think preservation and walk-bike infrastructure as two and three. Um, you can see that what we got was preservation as number one, but then we had efficiency and expansion, which essentially refer to building bigger roads or making um, traffic move more efficiently um, or more fat, faster um, as two and three. 
as you can see at the top, we provided quite a bit more description for those options in the Regional Planning Commission survey. It was not super clear what those were referring to. I think it was the right thing to do to provide more description for those options, but we did not provide more description for uh, the other option. And I think that's part of why they didn't, um, part of why the results were what they are for this question. So it'll be interesting to see um, what the Regional Planning Commission uh, gets in terms of results to this in its next survey, which I think will go out um, this year. So keep an eye on that. Um, so this, uh, we asked basically your level of agree uh, agreement for a statement. And the statement for this question was investments in walking and biking infrastructure, such as sidewalks and bike lanes would make our communities healthier and more enjoyable places to live. And we found that 73% of people um, agreed or somewhat agreed. So again, really strong support, um, pretty uncontroversial. Um, we do see high levels of support from Burlington residents, younger people, uh, and women. Um, again, you know, we asked people their level of agreement. The statement was that investments in walking and biking infrastructure are good for local business because they create more foot traffic. And 69% of people agree with this one. Um, and again, highest levels of agreement from the lowest income group, um, youngest folks and women. So, you know, I think that this is really encouraging people, people get the connection between the need to have people out of their cars, uh, walking around, enjoying the, the built environment uh, in order for them to have successful businesses in their community. And that when you build a place just that's fast for cars to drive through, you're not creating an environment where local businesses are going to thrive. <clears throat> this was um, getting into basically how people would prioritize um, design elements when they're looking at a street that has businesses on it. So think about it like a main street or a commercial street. Um, and we ask people to rank their priorities um, from one to seven. Um, and basically what we saw was, of course, safety was number one. That's not a huge surprise. People want to see everyone safe um, when they're interacting in a, you know, a commercial business street. Um, Number two was creating a place where people want to spend time and money. I think that's sort of similar to that last result, right? People people think that it's important to get folks out of cars, you know, make the public realm feel uh, enjoyable and welcoming in order um, for business to be successful. Um, cost was number three. They don't want to spend you know a ton of their tax money on it, um, and then parking for cars, unfortunately, still is number four. So. Not a huge surprise to those of us who, who work on this kind of advocacy that parking is still um, important to a lot of people. Um, and then we have reducing delay for people driving, reducing delay for people walking and biking, and parking for bikes. Um, so you know, I think I think this kind of is about in line with with what I tend to experience as an advocate, right? Like we see that people people want the idea of safety, but that it, it sort of becomes. Um, a political fight once removing parking or uh, increasing the cost of the project um, comes into the question. Also, I think interesting, you know, the reducing delay for people walking and biking. I think people don't tend to think about, um, you know, a signalized intersection where a person walking has to stop and wait uh, as a delay. Um, I think that there's some work to do for us to emphasize that, you know, People walking uh, experience delay too, and that it would be, uh, it's really important to reduce that to make walking um, much more convenient and uh, easy to do. So another uh, relatively uncontroversial one, we asked, do you support or oppose each of the following potential policies for your community? And this policy was adding more sidewalks and crosswalks. And 85% of people uh, strongly or somewhat support this one. So there's there's not a whole lot to say about this. You know, I think we all see this also that sidewalks are pretty uncontroversial. Um, and the struggle really is just to find the money to keep up with, with maintenance on them. So this is where we get a little more controversial when we start talking about uh, protected bike lanes. 
Um, we asked, uh, do you support or oppose uh, adding protected bike lanes to your community? 66% of people uh, overall support with 31% opposing. Um, and we see that women, people of color, the youngest age group and the lowest income group have the highest levels of support. So I think that this was really encouraging. Um, this question is just asking straight up, do you support adding protected bike lanes? People do want to see more protected bike infrastructure. It's where we get into the trade-offs uh, that it gets more controversial when we see the support drop off. So um, we asked, would you support or oppose adding protected bike lanes to key roads in your community if doing so resulted in fewer parking spaces and or travel lanes for cars? So first off, we don't totally know if people are responding to the travel lanes or the parking removal, but that is, that is something I tend to think it's the parking. But we do see that um, only about 38% of people strongly or somewhat support this um, and about 60% strongly or somewhat oppose adding protected bike lanes if it requires uh, removing parking or travel lanes. Uh, we also see that people of color uh, more strongly oppose this than white people. And we see that opposition actually increases as household income declines. So basically the lowest um, income group has the highest level of opposition to this. So it's, you know, it, it, it conflicts with a lot of the other things that we see in the data in the survey where those groups tend to be the strongest supporters of walking and biking, also had strongest levels of support for protected bike lanes in general. But when you frame it as a trade-off, that support drops off. So, you know, I think it's instructive that, you know, we, we do need to take care when we're looking at an impact like removing parking in particular. Um, I think this also gets at the fact that we're in this sort of like halfway stage where we have built some of our bike infrastructure. We're getting to a point where we're having to make some harder choices about whether we're gonna have parking on a street or a bike lane but we haven't built out a cohesive network yet. And so when you remove parking on any one street, it doesn't necessarily feel like as much of a benefit as it would if the whole network outside of that street was already built up. So it's a bit of a transitional phase. I think there's work to do on messaging in terms of how, you know, building out this network and getting more people uh, biking, you know, will reduce pressure on parking, um, you know, talking about, how when you build infrastructure for cars, more people drive, more people need to park. Um, so this is a really interesting result and something to keep in mind. So getting into some policies, um, we asked people um, if, they, if they support or oppose allowing people riding bikes to use pedestrian signals to cross intersections after coming to a complete stop and yielding to pedestrians. So basically this is, if you're on a bike coming up to a red light, um, you would stop. And then if the pedestrian signal comes on in your direction of travel, you're able to proceed through the intersection on the red light after you've yielded to pedestrians. Um, and there's really strong support for this. Uh, this policy is already in place in Burlington. Uh, I think this is something that other municipalities should look at as well. On the other hand, people generally oppose what we call um, Idaho stop or stop as yield, um, which is giving people on bikes the right to treat stop signs as yield signs when there's no other traffic present. Um, so 60% opposition to that. A few groups did have majority support, uh, including people of color, uh, those who rode, those who report modes of transportation other than driving, and those who report uh, biking and e-biking as a secondary mode. So, um, I think this is, you know, Idaho stop and stop as yield policies do have a pretty clear safety benefit. They've been implemented in, in a, quite a few states and a few municipalities at this point. Um, so I think there's, there's some education to be done on this one. So that's the end of our uh, second section. And please do uh, post your, your questions uh, or raise your hand if you have a question. Just are, are going over our key points. Um, improving walk and biking infrastructure is broadly supported. Um, but for a lot of folks, at least in our data, it isn't the highest priority. And the support does drop off when it's framed as a trade-off for car infrastructure. Um, the highest support for increased walk-bike investment and initiatives comes from Burlington residents, people of color, 
and the lowest household income group, although there is that data point around um, protected bike infrastructure and parking removal um, that we need to consider. Uh, third, residents understand the importance of walking and bike infrastructure to local business and really rank safety and, and quality of place highly among commercial street design. Um, and finally, allowing people on bikes to cross intersections on pedestrian signals is uh, broadly supported. All right, I think we've got some, some questions to get through here. Yeah, so um, Jean asks about, um, I believe it was the slide that discussed the um, relationship between investment um, and impact to investment into walk bike infrastructure and impact to um, local businesses. He asks, what, what's the breakdown on the agreement group? And I'm not sure if I fully understand that. Um, let's see. It's hard to know if it was this one, we do have sort of the break. This is the breakdown of the agreement group on the right side here. Um, you said the slide before trade-offs, which was. Gene has his hand raised, so maybe we can unmute him. Okay, Gene, should be able to go ahead. Right, thanks, Jonathan. Um, just the, the difference between the somewhat and the like fully agree, I think is on the, a previous slide that breaks down this uh, 67%. Uh, and maybe, may, may, well, go back one. Yeah, that, no, I mean, I, maybe just go forward. Two. This one here. So there's a big difference between a somewhat agree and a strongly agree. So I'm just curious about um, that that breakdown. Thank you. Got it, okay, yeah, let's, um, I'll try and pull that up really quick and Susan, let's grab another question while I'm getting to that. Uh, let's see, here's Stu um, is suggesting, well, let me jump to your second one, Stu. How do cyclists know that it's legal to use the pedestrian signal in Burlington? Uh, yeah, they don't. There, there's definitely a need for, for education on that. Um, so yeah, we've we've talked with the city about doing some of that. Um, but but yeah, frankly, there there is quite a bit of need for, for some more education there. And uh, Stu also asks if we collected demographic or city slash village where the respondent lives or works. Um we, the demo is just on uh, where you live, not where you work. So that's when we talk about Burlington residents versus residents in the rest of the county, it's just based on where you live. Um, Stu, you ask also about uh, number seven, I'm not sure what you're referring to there, but about bike parking, uh, a, suggest a suggestion that it might be helpful to ask a separate question about um, the impact or how people feel about having bike parking that's watched and very secure as an option, especially in Burlington. But the, I guess, as, as a barrier to biking, what the impact of that might be to provide that kind of um, bike parking opportunity. Yeah, so let's see, I can, um, if we're talking about barriers, let's go back. Um, we did not see lack of safe bike parking come up um, as, a, as a strong reason on um, barriers to biking. We do talk a little bit about that in the e-bike section. It did come up there. Um, Stu, if you were asking about, oops. If you're asking about this question, you know, we. I think it's sort of just lumped into parking for bikes and the level of importance there, right? We're asking about their, about their priorities um, when they're saying the design of the street and parking for bikes was, you know, a priority for 10% for of people. Uh, yeah, it looks like it was that one. And he was clarifying that maybe it'd be interesting to ask specifically about a particular type of 
bike parking um, yeah. opportunity. Yeah, definitely, definitely would be interesting. I would love to get more data just on bike parking specifically. Um, we were, you know, limited in the number of questions we, we had to work with here. So we tried to keep it kind of high level-ish. Um, so just, just on Jean's question, which was in regard to this slide, um, for this one, 26% strongly agreed and 42% somewhat agreed. So that was the breakdown of the agree demographic for this one. So uh, moving on, Ian uh, commented about the Idaho stop. Um, I see that he has his hand raised, so maybe he would like to, to share his thoughts about that. Let's do it. Okay, Ian, go ahead. Mute, I see. Uh, actually, I pressed the wrong button. I pressed the hand raise when I really meant to make the comment in the chat. So if the comment in the chat is clear, that's what I intended. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, so your comment was that a reason to oppose Idaho stop is that all road users should be treated equally. Got it. That is, that's definitely something that, that I've, you know, heard, and I think that there is a strong perception among the population in general that's sort of like same road, same rules. Um, and on the one hand, that's really clear and maybe useful in that regard. In the other hand, uh, the roads and the rules that we've made are really for cars, right? Like people walking, people biking, you know, don't need stoplights, except for the fact that there are cars on our roads. Um, and, you know, when you ask a person on a bike or a person walking to abide by rules that are really made for infrastructure that's at the scale of a car, you generally um, make it harder for them to get around. So, you know, it's a very different vehicle. Another you know thing to consider is when a person on a bike rolls up to a stop sign, they have a much wider field of peripheral vision than a person in a car. They have use of their hearing. Um, they're generally moving at a slower pace in general, and so have more time to take in their surroundings. Um, they also are the vulnerable user, right? So a person on a bike uh, generally is not going to cause uh, harm to a person in a car if they crash into them. Generally, the person on the bike is the vulnerable user, or the person walking is the vulnerable user. Um, and so there are a lot of reasons why you know it's it's pretty safe, and the data backs this up for a person on a bike to. Um, to roll through a stop sign when there is no other traffic present. At the moment, the law is to stop at a stop sign and people should be doing that, but I do think it's something worth thinking about. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Charlie Jones, um, he's noticing that um, a takeaway from the presentation so far is that there's a real need for greater awareness raising and education of biking and walking and rolling. Um, and he's wondering if there are funds available for generating video and social media posts that would help um, create better awareness and understanding. Um, I don't know about there being funds available. Um, I I totally agree that there there is a need for um, more you know awareness raising, um, and I think you know especially when there's a specific. Thing that we're trying to raise awareness of, like, you know, people in Burlington being able to, when they're on a bike, use a pedestrian signal to cross an intersection. I think that's really productive. Um, you know, I think like general education and awareness raising and like a use your seatbelt, follow the rules kind of thing. I don't see that as being super effective, to be honest. Um, and, you know, we, we do some of that at local motion, and um, I think it's work we're gonna keep doing. Um, but you know, the the data pretty strongly says, and, and experience in other places really pretty strongly says that if you want more people walking and biking, if you want safer roads, uh, you have to build them um, to encourage walking and biking and to be safer. And that really means um, doing the engineering work. Uh, building places with destinations close to origins um, and making it safe to get around outside of a car and convenient. Great, thanks. 
Um, Will Dodge has an interesting question about the protected um, bike lane responses uh, that we received. He's wondering if respondents, if they were asked about their perspectives related to um, rebuilding, widening sidewalks to create multi-use off-road paths, if they might be um, more receptive to that as it reduces that sort of trade-off with cars issue. Um, so I think, you know, Will, you specifically mentioned the Route 15 uh, multi-use path, which I think is a great piece of infrastructure and it, it didn't require any parking removal or the removal of a travel lane for cars. Um, I, and I think, yeah, when you can, when you can eliminate the trade-off, um, then the support for, for building the infrastructure certainly increases, um, I think there are a lot of contexts where you can't eliminate the trade-off, where there just isn't room in the right of way to have, you know, the travel lanes you have right now or the parking lanes you have right now and the, the safe walk bike infrastructure that you want. So, you know, especially in, in our denser areas um, that, you know, the trade-off is usually baked in and it's going to be a, a political fight to decide whether or not it gets made. Great. Um, and then Deb Sachs is asking in general about the breakdown in responses, uh, I guess, uh, responses from Burlington versus um, the entire um, total number of responses that were received for the survey. Um, I would have to pull up the, the cross tabs, but I don't have in front of me right now. Let me see if I can get them really quick. Um, is there is there another question, Susan, or is that the last one? Uh, we have two. Well, let's see. Stu, do you have a, a question? Your hand is raised. And just real quick, we had 146 responses from Burlington and 442 from the rest of the county. So that was a breakdown there overall. Um, and we will put a link. I'll put the link right now in the chat. And um, if you go to that link, you can see uh, the crosstab results, which is sort of all the numbers. There's a narrative report, the open-ended responses, all the, everything from the surveys um, in that folder. Um, let's let's keep it moving so I'm gonna show you through all of it. <clears throat> okay, section three, we're gonna talk about e-bikes. So uh, first off, we asked folks, um, do you own e-bike? And just, uh, so do you own e-bike and how interested are you in using e-bike for transportation purposes? And so what we saw um, is about, you know, a 6% um, ownership rate overall in the county for e-bikes um, and around 39% overall are interested in using e-bike for transportation. When you look at the youngest age group, people of color, the lowest household income group, those ownership rates go down a bit and the interest rates go up. Um, so looking at the lowest household income group, they have a 3% um, ownership rate and 56% of them are interested in using e-bike for transportation. Um, so a lot of interest out there in e-bikes, especially among the folks that we think of as uh, marginalized groups. Uh, Barriers to e-bike use and ownership. Um, this is the full selection. You do see a lack of secure bike parking pop up here. Um, you also see, you know, cost really as, as the primary barrier far and away. Um, and then distance to destination, as, as you may know, is still number two, but it's a much lower percentage compared to when we asked about biking in general. So this gets at um, Will's point about an e-bike really uh, helping to address those uh, commute distances. So this slide is sort of emphasizing those findings, cost being that number one barrier, and it's disproportionately affecting the lowest household income group. They reported it at the highest rate, uh, followed by Burlington residents and the youngest age group. And there is, of course, probably some overlap um, in those populations. And then lack of secure bike parking we saw was uh, particularly um, reported by Burlington residents. Um, and then uh, again, that distance to destination difference, um, it being less of a barrier when it comes to e-bikes. 
Um, we asked about uh, utility incentives. So are you aware that you'd like purchase rebate incentives available through Vermont Power Utilities? Um, and what we saw is that around 29% of people uh, know about them, which is pretty good. Um, unfortunately, only 19% of the lowest household income group know about them. So there's this really interesting pattern here where the lowest household income group uh, has the, the lowest rate of e-bike ownership, but is the most interested in using them for transportation. Uh, cost is the primary barrier to them getting an e-bike. Uh, and they are least aware of the utility incentive that would help them reduce the cost. So um, certainly a big opportunity there to um, better promote the incentives that are available. We, we didn't ask about the state incentive as part of this question because it was brand new when we uh, administered this survey. And so awareness probably would have been really low. Um, I think it's pretty safe to assume that awareness of that incentive is still lower um, than uh, that is for the utility incentives. So we asked, uh, getting into the um, getting into the, the controversial issues again, do e-bikes pose a safety concern on shared use paths? Um, and the question was, do you feel that e-bikes pose a safety concern to people walking, biking, or using devices like wheelchairs in shared spaces such as bike paths? Um, and we saw, you know, a real split on this one, around 30% saying yes, uh, you know, about a quarter saying no, and about half saying, or sorry, about half saying no, and about a quarter saying not sure. Um, so, you know, I think this is one to keep an eye on. I think, you know, the number of people that don't have an opinion really reflects that, you know, a lot of people aren't, maybe not, not spending time on bike paths, or just don't have a lot of experience around e-bikes. Um, but you know, with 30% 30, 30 of people saying yes, I think it was something for us to, to pay attention to. Um, you know, municipalities have, some municipalities like Burlington have been working to address this um, with etiquette and education campaigns. Um, you know, people on regular bikes can go just as fast as a person on an e-bike. They can make, you know, close passes just like a person on an e-bike. Um, so I think that's likely a, a, an approach that makes sense, but um, longer term, I think it's definitely worth thinking about, you know, if we really should be mixing, you know, in particular people walking and people on e-bikes and electric cargo bikes and those sorts of things um, on paths. And, you know, we may just need to build uh, more good bike infrastructure, more good walk infrastructure. So uh, the key points for the e-bike section, uh, there's a quick one, the, the countywide ownership rate is around 6%. Younger people, people of color, those with lower household incomes are, are really most interested in using e-bikes for transportation. Uh, cost is identified as the top barrier to e-bike ownership and low-income residents are the least aware of those utility incentives. Um, and e-bikes appear to reduce the significance of distance to destination as a barrier to biking. And that is uh, the end of the presentation. Uh, I put the link in the chat where you can find the, all the survey data set and the report and these slides. Um, and let's go back to the questions and comments. We've got about five minutes left here. I so, uh, right. yeah, I was going to say, um, John Riley is asking what utilities offer incentives. I'm going to share a link to that. I know Green Mountain Power is one, Burlington Electric. Um, Here's a link to Drive Electric Vermont that should have the full list. Yeah, great. Thanks, Susan. Um, Deb is suggesting that slide 30 might be shared with legislators to reduce the complexity on distribution of rebates. Yeah, we, um, <clears throat> I think we, I can't remember if we shared this with legislators last year, but we certainly will share it again. Um, you know, I think overall this data on e-bikes um, is, is really important to share, not just about the awareness of incentives, but the interest level and, and the groups that are interested. Um, I think it's pretty instructive and really positive. Um, so we will definitely be sharing this with legislators. Um, they did, you know, VTrans and legislators did make an effort um, in this last session to make the rebates more focused on lower income residents. They did, um, 
increase the rebate amounts and lower the income threshold. Um, so, you know, we would like to see there be more money overall available for e-bikes for, for all populations and for, in particular, the, the incentives for the lower income folks to be uh, much higher than they are now. So that's definitely something we're going to be advocating for um, in this coming session. Great. And Will, you know, was also kind of raising the awareness question um, around the e-bike incentives that that the utility could uh, maybe do a better job by putting that information in some postcards uh, or otherwise, uh, out, you know, outreach to the community. I'm not sure if that's something that they're doing now or not. Yeah, I don't know if that's being done. I, um, it is something that we're, we're going to be talking with the utilities about. And then uh, Stu, one last comment from Stu. He's just suggesting that adding a slide on the demographics of respondents might might help uh, folks kind of better interpret the data. But otherwise, great presentation. Yeah, thank, thanks, Stu. And um, yeah, we certainly can add that. And if you look at the the cross tabs um, spreadsheet that has all the demographic breakdown. Um, to to be clear, though, the demographics of this survey are are basically as close as possible to the demographics of the county. That's, that's what makes it statistically representative. Um, so that's that's it, unless there are other questions out there, we will um, we'll close it out. Um, Susan's gonna put uh, some links in the chat to some resources that we've got going. I wanna emphasize we do have a, uh, a whole series of webinars planned for this uh, fall, winter, and early spring that's really intended to help local advocates um, understand you know, how they can make change in their communities, uh, what are some things to focus on, uh, understand the resources and programs that are out there. Um, so I encourage you to sign up uh, for those webinars. Um, this was recorded, so you'll also get a link to the recording. Um, and uh, there are a few other links that Susan's going to put in the chat, I think, to our um, statewide uh, Walk Bike Advocates Forum uh, and our technical assistance page, which, you know, Susan and I are really available to local advocates and local groups to help you make change in your communities. That's, that's what we're here for. So don't hesitate to reach out. And um, yeah, you'll get an email with some follow-up info and links. So thanks so much, everyone, for coming and uh, look forward to talking with you soon.